This is the Voice of Russia from London. I'm Tim Eckert. Today I'm in conversation with Frank Ledwidge, a former military intelligence officer and barrister. He worked in Afghanistan helping to set up an improved judicial system. But as time went on, he became disillusioned with the value of British involvement in Afghanistan. He also wondered just how much the British Afghan campaign was costing, and he's now written a book entitled Investment in Blood: The True Cost of Britain's Afghan War. What was it about being in Afghanistan that made him doubtful? It didn't take too long be- before it became clear that we really weren't welcome there. The uh, watershed day was a, a friend of mine who used to live outside the wire. Very unusually, she was a journalist called Jean McKenzie, a very brave American journalist who spent many, many months, years actually in Afghanistan outside the wire, uh, training journalists. And uh, I, I said, oh, how, how do people see us outside? How do they, uh, what's their perception of the British mission? And she said, oh, well, they, they hate you out there. You, you didn't know that. And that was a surprise to you? Yes, it was. It was an acute surprise. She said that many Hamandis believe that the British, who had not even at that time covered themselves in much glory concerning uh, either the military side, but more specifically the development side, which we'd promised great development there. We're going to bring good governance. We're going to bring development to to Helm. And none of this, of course, had transpired, and none of it has transpired But since. But uh, apparently, the, she said, the Helmandi's view was that we had been screwing up, forgive the language, deliberately. You lost the Battle of Maiwand in 1880, and this is your revenge for that. Now, whether or not it's the case that we were failing deliberately, which it certainly isn't. We were putting every effort in to succeed. That was the impression that real people outside those barbed wire fences and machine gun towers, that was what they thought of us. And then I thought, well, how much did all this cost? One day in 2011, a British general referred in an article in the Guardian newspaper to an investment in blood that we must not allow the investment in blood to be wasted. Well, we had made an investment in blood, but we also made an investment in in money and in effort and in national prestige into this. And I wanted to analyse and see, well, what has been the cost of this misconceived campaign? You, quite forensically and quite in quite a, a methodical way, I guess because of your legal training, you go into trying to pin down the different government departments that have operated and are operating in Afghanistan. Obviously, there's the clear military budget, or I use the word clear advisedly. There yes. is uh, the supposed military budget, but then there are all kinds of things like the Department for International Development. There are a lot of consultants working there. But the sheer sums that you come up with are, are quite incredible. I mean, you predict a, a probable total expenditure for Britain in Afghanistan of something like £40 billion pounds and it's already in the sort of 30 plus billion pound market break that down for us what does that mean the ministry of defense itself confessed or claimed or proclaimed they they have no shame in this kind of thing uh, that they have no idea and this was to the defense committee in i think late 2010 2011 they have no idea how much money has been spent in helmand they produce a a budget pretty much every year when at least whenever asked by parliament to do so which is uh, intermittently the latest figure that I'm aware of was is about 17.3 billion. I'm rounding down, and that's correct or was correct to April 2012. But it's been running at about 3 billion, 3.5 billion a year. Now that's only what they call the additional cost, which is the lowest possible estimate or lowest possible basis of estimate you can find. So it doesn't include things like so-called provisions. It doesn't include all the work going on in the UK, needless to say, salaries of, of, of military personnel. But it's a fair basis, and I use that. So I, I extrapolate forward to 2015 using MOD's own figures. It costs £300,000 a year per soldier, not including his kit. So it's about £350,000 per year per, per soldier, about £1,000 a day. That level of expenditure isn't going to continue. But I reckon by looking reasonably conservatively forward to 2015, we'll be looking at about £25 billion expenditure on the campaign. I haven't included any expenditure after that because there's insufficient data. We don't know what level of commitment there's going to be. So that's the military side. Now, there's also the fact that we've kept an army, a very big army, much bigger than the army that we really need for our defence purposes, for much longer than we need 
to do so. And there's some evidence to suggest that some senior members of the British Army felt that a Helmand campaign was a good opportunity to retain a large army or retain certain elements of a large army without having them being challenged by Parliament or by the political nation. Uh, and we often hear that, don't we, that the armed services, the RAF, the Navy and the, the army squabble about who's going to oh, yes. have to make cuts, etc., if the government wants to tighten the belt. But you're implying or stating in the book that one possible element of the campaign in Afghanistan was the army saying, actually, you know, use it or lose it. If we don't demonstrate that we're needed there, we might be cut. Uh, that, that's right, yes. The inter-service rivalry in British defence in the British defence world is totally toxic. Uh, the, the, the amount of hair pulling and backstabbing that goes on, for example, concerning the aircraft carriers, I mean, this is moving out of Afghanistan, the various aircraft they use, uh, uh, the kit budgets is, is, is incredible. And, and of course, all that squabbling is carried out by more generals per square inch than any other major army in, 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 in the world. So I, I estimate we spent about three billion or so uh, more than we should have done on the military. So that's that's the mili military budget. We also need another two billion to bring our forces back and reset them. So up to about 30, 31 there. The real money is going to come in looking after the wounded. And I've been extremely conservative. You've which got is, a figure in there of 3.8, let's yeah. call it 4 billion pounds on the future care of British veterans. Yeah. So well over 10% of the 31 odd billion pounds you estimate as the military cost there, but almost double what Britain will have spent on the so-called civilian development program in Afghanistan. Yeah, concerning the development budget, that's, uh, that runs about between 2 and 2.5 billion over the last uh, 10 to, to, to 12 years. Yeah. One of the other startling statistics in your book is you're saying that the total expenditure for Britain in Afghanistan would be enough to run a thousand primary schools for 40 years yes. or train 5,000 police officers and pay for their entire careers. Yes, that's of course assuming assuming the figures I've, I have are all that we've spent, which as I say, the probably figures I put forward are much, much too low and that we're not paying interest on, on those. Those are figures I, I came up with. Yeah. On the basis it costs about a million pounds a year to run a fairly small primary school. Why has no one else gone into the figures in this depth and until now, do you think? I mean, given our preoccupation in this country and indeed the government's preoccupation with budgets and, and how much the British government has to spend on all manner of things to do with running the country. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I was very surprised it hadn't been done before. So the Ministry of Defence shy away from this. The Defence Committee of the House of Commons regularly asks the Ministry of Defence for a full accounting of what they've spent. And of course, the Ministry of Defence outlay on on the campaign is only a, a proportion of the whole cost uh, and they're consistently pushed back you know we do we simply don't know we can't tell you and and uh, it, it's all it's all much too difficult in fairness to the uh, department for international development if you want to know how much they've spent on afghanistan i mean it takes a bit of finding on their website they'll tell you and they'll tell you down to the last penny now whether that money's got done any good or has gone to good, any kind of good cause is a different question but at least you know how much they've spent that is absolutely not the case with the Ministry of Defence they have no idea Presumably there'll be some people who read your book or listen to you uh, speaking who will just say well wars are expensive uh, they're much more expensive than civilians can possibly understand but there was a political reason for going to Afghanistan which uh, you can't do a straight accountancy reckoning on the value of what Britain is doing in Afghanistan before you embark on a war, you should be clear on what kind of war it is you're embarking upon and what it is you're in, you intend to achieve. We're still not clear in Afghanistan what it is we intend to achieve. There's still no, not even on the horizon, uh, glimmer of a political settlement. War is essentially a political act. What war has been for us in Afghanistan is an entirely military activity. In other words, it has been existential war completely unlinked to any political reality on the ground. But it, it was meant to be a part of the war against terror. It was meant oh. to be the defeat of the Taliban. It was mm. meant to be the stopping of a, of a culture and an area which was seen as uh, unstable mm. and posed a threat to the West and specifically to Britain. Before we arrived, we the British arrived in Helmand, there were virtually no Taliban in, in Helmand. Helmand was, a, was a, insofar as any province was in Afghanistan, a Taliban-free zone. Helmand was run by a bunch of warlords, uh, who were essentially sympathetic to the so-called Afghan government. We deposed one of those warlords. His men went over to the Taliban. This is a very simplistic way of putting it. It was pretty much accurate. And then the Taliban appeared in force. The Taliban, of course, most of them are not terrorists. They are, most of them, uh, local farmers, the same kind of people that fought the Soviets in the 80s, resistance fighters, however you want to frame them. Uh, NATO ISAF, that's the 
uh, overseeing force in, in Afghanistan, uh, estimate that most uh, Taliban fight within walking distance of their homes, which isn't surprising because they're defending their homes. And that's how they see it. As for al-Qaeda, the last time any al-Qaeda were on record as having, or any, in any force, of having uh, set foot in, um, in Helmand was in November 2001. As far as I'm aware, we haven't killed or captured any major numbers or any, any al-Qaeda at all in, in Helmand. Hel Helmand's irrelevant to any war against terrorism. It's totally irrelevant. This has been a catastrophic failure, a failure of imagination, a failure of politics, a failure of thinking, a failure of strategy. And it has not assisted our national security. On the contrary, it has damaged our national security. You make the point in your book, Investment in Blood, that in fact all the evidence points to the truth that terrorism originates, and I'm quoting from your book, not in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan. And so if you look at these large sums we're talking about, let's call it 30 odd billion pounds, if that money had been spent in some kind of campaign within Pakistan, albeit aid or education or PR, whatever you like to call it, in your view that would be more effective than fighting in Afghanistan? The CIA, that is to say the Central Intelligence Agency, estimated in late 2011 that there were between 50 and 100 al-Qaeda operatives in Afghanistan. That's not in Helmand, by the way. There are very few, if any, in Helmand. In Afghanistan. Insofar as al-Qaeda exists in that region, it is in Pakistan that the problem lies, and every every terrorism animal, analyst accepts and realizes that. So, who, well, who are the people fighting at British troops? Who are firing at them and blowing them up in Afghanistan? They're the people we used to call the Mujahideen. They're local groups of men. There are some Taliban from Pakistan, from outside. The Helmandis know them as the Asli Taliban or the real Taliban. But most fighters are local men fighting foreign occupation. Afghanistan and the war in Afghanistan was justified by the British government on the grounds that this was uh, a potential breeding ground for terror. It was an area where uh, terrorists would be trained, could be trained, where there was a fundamental, uh, fundamentalist movement which could sweep across, uh, spread outside Afghanistan. It was also a centre of the drug trade. This was all money that would eventually be funneled back into al-Qaeda. I mean, these were the perfectly, it would seem, laudable motives for sending British troops in there. Well, you know, there's, if, you, if you want to train as a terrorist, there are any number of places in the, in the world you can train as a terrorist. That was the case in the 90s. It's the case now. Uh, none of the 9-11 uh, terrorists trained, as far as I know, at least they certainly didn't train in the skills they used on 9-11 in Afghanistan. None of the 7-7 terrorists here trained in Afghanistan. The IRA doesn't train in Afghanistan. It trains in back rooms in Belfast, as it always did, or in the hills of Ireland. This is a, it's a fig leaf. So what, why is Britain there? I suspect they're there because we attach far too much importance to the so-called special relationship. Now, the military, the British military, is particularly desperate to retain their standing within the US military establishment as the number one ally of choice. We cannot simply act. Every time the Americans wish to uh, take part in a vast military operation somewhere, that is not necessarily does not necessarily follow that we must therefore act as their auxiliaries in doing so. And unfortunately, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, that's exactly what we've done. I remember speaking to a very, very senior British military officer, and we were discussing strategy, and I said, well, it's about time we had our own strategy in Helmand, and we uh, pursued our own national interests, which, of course, would be to, to leave as quickly as possible. This was about a year ago, slightly more. He said, we can't have a strategy. We we're in a coalition. Of course, the French had a strategy. They left at the end of 2011 or announced it. The Dutch went in 2011, I think. The Canadians in 2012, they had their own national strategy. Why can't we? And the answer is we, we are, unfortunately, beholden to this legend of the special relationship. Uh, this is, of course, our generation's Vietnam. In the real Vietnam, Harold Wilson gave an order to his diplomats that whatever happened... We were not going to lose a single soldier in the, de in the jungles of Vietnam. And they were to come up with arguments in order to make it, make, make it clear to the United States that there will be no British involvement. And that's exactly what happened. I fail to understand why that approach cannot be taken now. And by the way, we didn't suffer by it. Why isn't this more of a political hot potato if it's as bad as you claim in your book? I, I suspect it may well become so. I suspect when the dust begins to settle on the Iraq and Afghan wars and people begin to realise that the primary reason for us being in Afghanistan was the special relationship. And let's not forget General Danat, who was chief of the general staff at the time, chief of the army, 
in 2007 said that Afghanistan presented an opportunity to show the Americans what we can do. I fail to understand why it, why we need to show the Americans or any other nation for that matter anything at all. It doesn't seem to bother the Germans or the Swedes or for that matter the Italians or name your country. The conflict in Afghanistan is also presented to the British public, to the wider world indeed, as also partly about helping the Afghans, about reconstructing Afghanistan, turning it into a modern democratic nation. In the book, you're, you're pretty sanguine about the prospects of that happening. Well, before, before we got to Helmand, and I'm particularly concerned in, in the book with, with Helmand, although I do discuss the rest of the country, Helmand was a, a, a fractious, warlord-ridden narco state. Its economy produced about half of Afghanistan's opium. That remains the case. Nothing has changed. The only difference is that since we arrived in 2006 in force, the level of opium cultivation has gone up considerably. And Helmand is now a much stronger narco state than it was before. Money talks. And the real money in Afghanistan is in opium. Helmand's at the centre of that, certainly not at the centre of the Taliban insurgency or al-Qaeda or anything like, like that, but what it is the centre of is the narco industry. But you also point out that, of course, Afghanistan is a culturally Muslim state and a, a lot of the ideas that are being presented by the British government and other foreign people working there, uh, a lot of their ideas and, and cultural norms as they're presented are fundamentally at odds with what people in Af Afghanistan are likely to tolerate, let alone want, in the longer term. There's also another factor at work here. Many of our priorities aren't Afghan people's priorities. Uh, let, let me be candid, and I speak as a human rights lawyer here, that's my background. Gender rights, what we call human rights, are not a priority for people in one of the poorest countries in the world who have not enough to eat. Now, except the narco Khans here who are exceedingly rich. But most people in Helmand are, as anybody vis visitor there or any of the provinces around, exceedingly poor. What those people need is not being preached at about what they're doing wrong, but being, being ha be given real assistance to make their lives slightly better and more easy. And we haven't done that. We failed in that. But there are lots of uh, mainstream books and films made about particularly women in Afghanistan wanting to have the freedom to be educated, to escape from under the thumb of the Taliban, uh, about democracy, about trying to eradicate corruption. Are you saying that that civil policy too is doomed to failure? Well, I, let, 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 let me offer an example of my own sector. The Afghan justice system, which is to say the state justice system, is ramshackle, corrupt, uh, inefficient and exceedingly distrusted by 90, probably 98, 99% of Helmandis, of Afghans as a whole, but Helmandis specifically. This is not the case, regrettably, with the Taliban justice system, which does not suffer from the levels of corruption, inefficiency, dishonesty, or un-Islamic, or accusations of un-Islamic behavior that the state system does. So I, I ask, ask this, if you have a dispute with your neighbor, are you going to bring that dispute to a forum which is chronically corrupt, run by people you regard as criminals, and enforced by a police force, so-called police force, the majority of which, by any count, are involved in the drugs trade, or at least addicted to one form or other of narcotics? Or are you going to bring it to the other guys down the road, who you know from the 90s, if they do nothing else, will give you justice? and we'll give it quickly, and you will not have to pay. And but justice well, that, 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 that the West regards as inhumane in many cases. That's right, that the West regards as inhumane, but that most Almanis do not necessarily regard in that way. Let me give you a case in point. I was speaking to a woman, one of the very few politically active women in, in Helmand, and she told me this. She said, you know, sometimes when I pass the stadium in Lashkagar, there's a small area which counted as the stadium where they used to conduct executions in the Taliban days, she said, you know, some days I wish... I wish we had those back, because at least then we felt safe. We don't feel safe now. Do you think that the Western intervention and policies inside Afghanistan are fueling that corruption that you talk about? Yes, well, when you stuff hundreds of millions, when you include American money, billions of pounds into an economy that's already uh, floating on opium, you're probably not going to come up with a result that's going to look like Switzerland. Most or much of the money that we've spent 
which goes, most of it goes, of course, through the Afghan government, is simply dissipated. It's just gone. Either that or, it, or, it's, or it's put through consultants, I have to say, like myself. I don't accept myself. I'm guilty as guilty as anyone else in all this. Uh, who are paid to conduct seminars and deliver advice and very well paid to do so. Every consultant in Afghanistan, he's paid his salary, which is quite considerable, but he also requires, if he's employed by the state, the US or the UK, a whole troop of bodyguards. Every consultant costs about £500,000 a year. If your assertions about what's going on in Afghanistan are true, the detail that you've gone into about the profligacy involved in, in the budgeting of how Afghanistan is administered from the West, that's likely to demoralise the troops, isn't it? I, I think it's important not to reify the troops or, 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 or see them as, as in some way victims in all this. You know, I, I, I have a friend who is an infantry officer. His platoon suffered nearly 50% casualties. And he takes the view, and he says this in terms, you know, we weren't there for any noble cause. We were there because we were professional soldiers doing a professional job, and we were doing it in the, to the best of our capabilities. We were doing a job we loved, with people we loved, which is to say our comrades. And that's how it is. Our soldiers, as to say British soldiers, I'm not going to trash their work. They did as well as anyone could have done. But you know what? In the words of one veteran friend of mine, very badly injured veteran, we did our best. It didn't work out. Given your experience of Afghanistan and your analysis of the seemingly wasteful way it's been funded in terms of the public purse, what's your instinct about the current situation in Syria and the, the way that the, the British government seems to be fairly gung-ho about possibly getting involved on some level, if, if at least uh, providing equipment? Well, you would, you would think that after two, uh, two campaigns that were at best, at very best, of questionable results, you might want to question whether you want to get into, and I'm talking here in the Middle East now, I'm talking about Iraq and Libya. Afghanistan is a separate, not in the Middle East, of course. You might want to think very carefully before you get involved in another one. But particularly in Syria, for us, again, we need to consider very carefully the environment into which we go. Syria for us is a place of souks and ruins. For Syrians, the British, when the British and the French come calling and they say, we're here to help, they start counting their spoons because when people in Syria, and I'm talking about everybody in Syria, thinks of the British and the French, they're thinking of an agreement from 1916 called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which divided up the Middle East between Britain and France in terms of spheres of influence. That agreement, whilst it's forgotten here, is not forgotten there. And let's remember something else. Our interests in Syria are extremely limited, first of all. Secondly, what do people, and I'm speaking of politicians here, really think they can do in this campaign? If a man is drowning a mile out at sea, it's great, we should save him. But what can you do to do so? And my answer in Syria is, let's, there are times when Palmerston's phrase masterly in activity, combined with diplomatic work and accepting that other countries, such as Russia, for example, have legitimate interests, just as we do, minimal though they may be, masterly in activity may well be the solution here. But making things worse will not help. But once again, in a parallel with Afghanistan, albeit not in the Middle East, the image that's being presented by the British government in this case is that intervening in Syria, as in, in Afghanistan, is primarily a humanitarian cause, which will have the secondary effect of perhaps protecting British interests or, or British people at some stage further down the road. If you're going to conduct a humanitarian mission, then let, let, let that happen and let it happen under the auspices of the United Nations. And whether we like it or not, that means we have to engage with Russia, with China and other nations that do not trust our motives, particularly after Libya where these countries were, and I, I speak here, I'm very in some way ashamed to say this, you know, uh, other countries see us as having pulled their wool over their eyes over Libya. And we've got, we've got a trust deficit to make up there. What about the cause of democracy, though? Uh, Britain, and I would say presumably France, and certainly the USA, would join voices in saying that the cause of promoting democracy, human rights, humanitarian causes in all of these places is something that these countries simply have to do because it's part of their culture. 
if they see abuse, if they see uh, civilian populations suffering as a result of what their governments are doing, it's up to the West to go in and try yeah. and make things better. All right. Well, somewhere between two and four million people died in Congo in between 1995 and now. And I don't see any shouts for British soldiers to be deployed there. And name your other African state. We, we have no more interest in Syria than we do in Congo. In fact, considerably less so. There are very few Syrians in Britain. There are plenty of Congolese. Uh, if you want to go down that track. Um, to, to address Syria straight on, I repeat, the United Nations was set up for exactly this purpose. That means you have to engage and cooperate with people you may not wish to go engage and cooperate with. The trouble is that in Syria itself, the people with whom we are dealing, with whom we, or in whom we place our trust, are not worthy of that trust, or at least if they are, we have no reason for believing so. There are dozens and dozens of armed groups in that country now, all of them armed to the teeth. I fail to see what good can be done by pouring more oil on that particular fire. So why why is the British government, do you think, being going out on a limb, I mean, sticking its neck out and saying, we, we, you know, Mr Cameron has said repeatedly, we must help the rebels because they're fighting an oppressive government which must be removed. Why would Britain feel the need to do that in a country which, as you say, Britain has very limited interests in? The only possible answer to that I can think of is a little bit of political grandstanding and failure to understand the environment in which you're operating. Your book is not going to make you very popular in Whitehall, is it? I hope not. What would you like the government or any British government to do about Afghanistan? I think the first consideration is to think carefully about any more involvements in situations where we do not have clear and practical strategic objectives. We have thousands of people now over the last, from the last decade in our country in wheelchairs because of a failure to do this. We have also put many thousands of people into graves as a result of a failure to understand what it is we were trying to achieve and when it, whether it could be achieved. We should have strong armed forces, we should have highly trained and capable armed forces as we have but they must only be used in our clear and unequivocal national interest, not in the interests of pursuing relationships with other country, countries or in pursuance of ancient and outdated ideas of so-called lib liberal interventionism. Those ideas should be put to bed. In fact, they should be put in their grave where they belong. Are you afraid that by saying something like that, some people will accuse you of being unpatriotic? I will take no accusations for being unpatriotic uh, from anyone. I've served my country in five wars now, each one serially less wise than the last. I served in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Iraq, in Afghanistan and in Libya. And I defer to no one for my love of country. No one at all. That was Frank Ledwidge, author of Investment in Blood, about the cost of the British campaign in Afghanistan. He was in conversation with me, Tim Eckhart.